Welcome to our live Q&A, your first 100 days as a freelance ESL teacher, brought to you by Crystal Clear ESL, supplier of professional purpose-built digital ESL lessons for easy step-by-step -step delivery over your choice of virtual classroom platform. Come check us out at esl-curriculum.com. I'm Crystal, here today with teacherpreneur Kevin D to answer all your questions about launching a successful solo ESL business. Let's get started. So let's talk a little bit about your teaching niche. Did you have one right from the start and do you still stick to it firmly? <laughs> you know that I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the rest of us know. Okay, so... Um, I think through working uh, with the companies first, I started realizing what my niche was. Um, and because of my qualification experience being rooted in therapeutic work with children and families. Um, so I used to work uh, with children uh, who were exposed to traumatic situations. So I dealt with trauma in children. So my niche is now therapeutic teaching. Um, I focus on three to 12 year olds with a special interest in the three to six year old group. Um, and I think it's really helpful to have a niche. It's important to distinguish, distinguish yourself and the services you offer. Um, and there's always going to be so many different students with varying needs and you can't serve them all effectively. Um, so I'm flexible to a degree as you know so i will for example if there is a child that's slightly older than what i usually stick to but i feel they have a need that i can assist with then i'll happily enroll them um but i do cap my flexibility as in i personally wouldn't for example i wouldn't take on an older student that is all about academic achievement and really into the deep uh, technical part of english grammar that wouldn't be suited to me that right. would just cause me stress. And then it would mean I'd have to change a lot that I do in my system, curriculum, et cetera. So I think you need to narrow it down. And I think it also helps you focus on A, what you're passionate about, what you're good at, what you're mm -hmm. confident in. And you kind of then can grow and be the expert in your field in the services that you offer. And how, yeah. yeah, and what I'm experiencing is, you know, in the beginning, there was a little bit like, oh, this person is coming to me, they want classes, I'm starting, I should just take everything. Um, yeah. yeah, you just kind of, you're so worried you're not going to make it, you just want to yeah. take everything you can. Um, but I realized that just is a slippery slope down, it really is. Um, because you eventually attract the students that are best suited to you and your services, you really do. Give it time. Right. Word of mouth is a powerful thing, you know, and I find if you are working with integrity and you're offering a good service and you're being sincere with what you're doing, um, they will come to you. They really will. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you don't want to be jumping around from one end to the other and just being, you know, a jack of all trades and master of none. It's, it's not right. great for you. It's not great for your business and it's certainly not great for your students. No, and ultimately it's decree it's not good for your wallet either because <laughs> by spreading yourself so thin and having to plan such a wide array of lessons, you're lowering your hourly rate considerably because you're only yes. ever paid for contact hours. So I completely get you. I've spoken to so many teachers who were just like scared getting started that they wouldn't get enough work. So took on anyone and everyone and very quickly realized that they were buried under a mountain of planning and preparation for this, you know, the whole spectrum of students. And, and yes. that's really hard to cycle back and get out of it because <laughs> I think innately we don't want to disappoint and we don't want to just like cut off these student relationships and mm -hmm. say, sorry, I'm not, I'm not teaching your type anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're so, not my type. No, yeah, exactly. Not you, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> So it's important to consider that niche and to be, you know, a little bit selective, at least from, from the mm. start. I completely agree with you. Okay. So um, what would you say are the three must haves for starting online ESL freelancing? Ooh, this was a tough one. I think obviously internet connection, 
first and foremost, um, it needs to be reliable. It needs to be fast. Um, you know, I have a 50 meg up and down and that has worked for me on all platforms. I've never had an issue with it. Um, I also make sure I have a LAN cable available for any other issues, Wi-Fi interruptions, anything. And also a decent laptop, I think is important. If you can yeah. invest in one, then that is a good thing to invest in. Um, right. For example, I teach children. So I have a limited amount of time to get through certain things because the lessons are shorter. And I don't really have time to wait for my laptop to catch up with me and join the party. You know, I need to go, 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 especially if I've got various tabs and programs open, which I yeah. usually do. And the other thing I realize now is really a good, solid, adaptable backend management system. Um, ah, so something that oh, is managing more. scheduling, your invoicing payments, tracking student progress, curriculum, things like that. Find something, even if it's something that's paid, it's going to save you a lot of stress and time. Have really. you tried a few? Do you have a few? No. I researched quite a bit at first. Um, I did look at a couple and I decided on Tutorbird in the oh, end. How do you use it? Yes. So I, I heard use good Tutorbird. things. What do you like about it? <clears throat> um, I like the invoicing system. It's very easy. It tracks my classes very easily. Um, and it, I can even automate the invoices so that after X amount of classes, it gets sent out. I don't have to calculate it. It just goes out. They can pay by just clicking on the invoice. It's very easy. Um, it is connected to PayPal, which worked for me because I use mm -hmm. PayPal as a gateway. Um, and also it has space for me to write my notes. So obviously coming from the companies, I do things a specific way because that's how I learned it. Um, and I give extensive feedback and I'm able to manage that through Tutorbird as well. Um, you know, right up to wow. the classes and it can, I can create a student portal as well. So each of my students can have their own files, their own folder, they can access, come in and out as they like. Um, access the material, um, change bookings if they want, but I've disabled that. Um, I'll tell you about that later. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I just find it very helpful oh, and you can do so much with change. it. Yeah. yeah. I don't allow it. Okay. That. <laughs> so the burning question, can it accept Chinese payments? Do you know? PayPal? Um, tutor, like, yeah, well, I guess. Yeah, because know. it's through PayPal. Mm. So okay. all so my, all my students are Chinese. Right. Okay. Good. So have you run up against any issues getting them to use PayPal? Cause I know it's not as widely known there. Um, no, not knowingly. I didn't have issues at first. And I think the difference with me was that my students and their parents knew me already. Yeah. So they were waiting for me to get up and running. So they were willing to do what was needed. So when I said to them, listen, this is how you need to pay me. Then they did that. They figured it out. Um, yeah, I do know that it's not as well used over there, but yeah. I haven't had any issues. Good. They all use it. Yeah, that's really good. Okay, great. So yeah, I think I need to give Tutorbird a try. <laughs> yeah, it's really helpful. I don't even know all the functions yet. Oh, really? Yeah, so, yeah. I would be interested to know if they do like subscription based um, lessons, like packages so that somebody just pays a monthly fee and it's auto withdrawn every month or is that? You can you know set that up. You can set oh. something like that up. Yeah, that would be cool. Okay, so we've talked about the things that you need, your must-haves for freelancing. What were your first challenges? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so many. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think um, the biggest challenge from a personal perspective, and I'll get to the technical parts later, is that, you know, getting all the systems in place, obviously, but also keeping a good work-life balance. Yeah. I'm still in the beginning stages. I've been doing this since June um, and I'm still trying to iron out the kinks. Um, although I've had, like I said, parents that were great, supportive, way, you know, rooting for me, wanting me to get started and they've been so supportive. But challenges after that was, you know, the things that were tricky would be curriculum. 
for that was a big thing for me. You know, figuring out what is the curriculum am I going to use, trying one, thinking this is the one, and then struggling with something here or realizing that it's not suited to my students, yeah. you know, and just trying to balance that out. That was a bit of a challenge for me. Um, trying to think, I suppose the pricing was quite tough to, to yes. figure out how am I going to price myself? How do I not undersell myself, um, but not charge too much? Um, right, not scare them off. So how exactly. did you? I What I did is I researched a little bit and I realized now what I did is I saw you advise some people on, I think you said something about doubling what you were earning somewhere. Yeah. yeah. I realize now that's pretty much what I did. So oh, wow. Yeah. Even, yeah. yeah it, Intuitively, that was it. I kind of looked on a few platforms, teaching platforms. Um, I looked at some European teaching platforms, uh, their pricing, what they were charging for uh, native speakers versus non-native speaker. I consider myself a native speaker. I'm first language yeah. English. Um, and I went according to that, but I had to be a little bit careful because some of them were still on a platform, some of my students, you know, and they were still, they were paying elsewhere, but they also wanted to transition over to me. So I kind of had to not charge too much and uh, market it in a way, listen, this is what I'm doing for now, because I know that you are paying Ooh. X amount over there. Um, I'm going to do this for the first month or so, um, and then I'm going to increase it. So I let them know that I just ah. didn't want to give them a shock. And I said, I, I know that. it's going to, yeah. And then I told them later, okay, it's time to increase. Can you do it? And they said, yes. And I said, let's go. Right, right. If you're not on mute and you're in the audience, can you just mute it for the moment? I love that. It's like a draw, a way to draw people in and get that initial commitment get them on board, loving your new setup outside of your contracted gig. It's like an extended trial for everyone and then sort of the norm. That's really yes. clever. Love it. Yeah, I think pricing is difficult. And you're right, Kevin D. I, I tend to say to look at what either you made as a contracted teacher or what teachers from your sort of background, um, you know, location, experience, qualifications tend to get paid and then double it for freelancing. And if you are overqualified for the role, i.e. Um, maybe you have an MA TESOL or a applied ling linguistics or something, um, a lot of the contracted companies don't sort of care about that. They won't pay those people more, but you do, you are worth more. So that's where I tend to think you could even potentially triple it with the appropriate niche. Mm. So I think, yeah, definitely you've done the right thing there. Good job. Yeah, I agree. I would say I'm not charging enough yet, but I mm. will start, you know, as I gain more experience and more confidence, I guess, and more yeah. students, then I will start increasing it more. Right, of course. Okay, so what misconceptions do you think there are about um, freelance ESL teaching? Hmm, what misconceptions? Yeah, like things that, that you're said to need, but you don't really actually need, mm. or, um, you know, maybe that it's going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. If we're looking at equipment, um, like I said, a good laptop with a decent camera is yeah. a definite must. Um, also, the headset's important. I don't think you have to pay for the best of the best, really. I use a mid-range one and I never have any issues. It's lasted well. My, signs, my sound is good because I test it on other platforms with friends. I always test things with people around me before yeah. just to make sure everything's good. So you don't have to go spend lots of money on that. And certainly not in the beginning. You know, when you can afford to later and you're, you're raking it in, by all means, go wild on a yeah. you know, spanking new headset. But um, <laughs> so <I'd>, matchy. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to spend a lot of money, if, especially if you can't, then don't. You know, there's a lot of ways to do this that you can do it in a way that's affordable for you to keep your overheads yeah. very low. There's so many That's so important. It is. Yeah. And there's so many this free options out there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, make exactly. use of them. You're... Yeah. Go ahead, sweetheart. Yeah. I use many cams, so that's something I do pay for. Yeah. Um, 
Um, there's a couple of other things, but minor things. Minicam is a big thing for me, especially working with the younger kids. Yeah. Um, what do you I, use it for? So for various things, I kind of just want to make the learning experience, you know, enrich the learning experience for the younger kids specifically. So yeah. for example, if I'm doing a topic like um, sea animals, then I will put a background on Minicam. It provides me an underwater background. There's so many different options. You can load your own things. You know, I use that, then I'm under the sea and I'll add a few different sea animals according to what uh, our target language is, you know, right. and just use it that way. It's, it's just so much better than sitting with a slide in front of you that says, you know, this is a fish, you know, this is an octopus. Yes. Um, you know, and just interacting with them and getting mm -hmm. them to really enjoy and watch and ooh and ah and, you know, just be playful with it. Yeah. I use it for rewards as well. Yeah, me too. Um, so that works well. And obviously I use it because I can type on the screen, I can text, I can do things all over there, draw, and just use it for so many things. It's actually ridiculous. I don't know what I'd do without it. It sounds like you need to give me a tutorial. <laughs> no. I, I figured out how to add gifts to Manicam for my rewards, yes. which I love and my kids love. But beyond that, no. I know how to use the record button. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, there's so many things you can do with the, yeah. your face. You can change things. Um, it's it's really fun for the kids. You yeah. know, and it's great if you don't have that actual physical prop handy. Something's come up in a lesson that you didn't think of or they've asked a question. Then yeah. Minicam's great because I just type in the word. Yeah. Up it comes. And there exactly. is there it is. You know, I don't yeah. need the flashcard. I don't need the prop. Although I do make use of a lot of props. I'm very much about props. Oh, do you? Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't. I'm a super minimalist teacher. I've had the same background since I started online teaching almost four years ago. And mm -hmm. I rely strictly on Minicam. And um, I have a couple of things. So I've got an ice cream. I've got a trophy. And I've got a microphone. And this Always is a winner. Every <laughs> single lesson. <laughs> <laughs> my binoculars are always a great win for oh, the kids. So There's good. so many things. Yeah, I love it. All right, cool. So do you think anyone can go freelance? I don't see why not, truthfully. Yeah, I really can't think of a reason why it's not something everyone could do. Do your research, educate yourself, follow the guidance of those who are doing it and making a success of it. And yeah know that it's going to be hard because you're really going to work your butt off, but it really yeah. is worth it, especially in the beginning. I'm yeah. still in that stage where I'm still figuring things out, but it's working well. I'm getting a constant flow of students in, which is great that I've actually had to start a waiting list. Um, wow. Which is you. great. Um, but uh, the reason I'm saying that is because this is just the beginning stages. I'm still figuring things out and it can be done. It really, it really can be done. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Okay. So that's really good. I've just had a question from Samantha to clarify the name of the software that we just mentioned, and that's ManyCam. I've noticed that I've tried to type it, but for some reason, Facebook's not mirroring my, um, my image, which is also why my, my logo is backwards. <laughs> Normally it's over it, here. It doesn't look backwards to me though. I see it. Oh, as, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, okay. I can read that's Manicam. perfect. Okay. It's just on my video screen then. That's good. So it's Manicam. You're welcome, Samantha. I think we're nearly done, but before we finish off and open up to general questions, I want to hear what's your best advice to someone looking to launch as a freelance ESL teacher. I think it would be to find what you are naturally drawn to and passionate about and make that part of your branding, if not all of your branding and niche. Um, yeah. As mentioned, running your own business is not easy. It's tough and there's going to be times when you're just going to want to go, no more, I've had enough, you know, and you just need that extra spark, that motivation that's just going to push you through, you know, and yeah. you need to be doing something you're loving and enjoying and getting a reward out of. So really yeah. find that, look for that in yourself. Um, if you're not even sure, speak to people around you, ask the people that know you, you know, 
what do you think I'm good at? What, what do you value about me? And bring that in, bring that into your teaching because yeah. there are so many different types of students out there that there are students for all of us. Really, there are for all our different niches, our different personalities, our different approaches. Um, and it's just a fun, it's about finding what is comfortable for you and how you want to work and then using that yeah. and connect, connect with people, network. There's so much support available out there. Use it. Yeah. And even take in it our group. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And take it step by step. You know, it's, it's very overwhelming when you see it as this big thing. Like the day after I found out I'm going to have private students, I just, I didn't know where to start. I, uh, there were tears for sure. What am I going to do? You know, and then you just, you make it happen step by step. Yeah. And yeah. Please absolutely. know and believe in your worth. Don't take it personally when things don't go as planned. Be flexible and know that it's happening as it should. Right. And have an end goal, but just try not to get lost in the details. It's hard. Right. But yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I would also add to treat it like a business because I think there's a separation between, um, at least for me, when I was doing contracted teaching, where I literally wake up, turn on my screen, off I go, then at the end of my teaching day, close it down and walk away. And um, actually, when you're a freelancer, there's a whole other aspect of your work, and that is running an actual business. So it's good to have multiple hats and to either be able to um, wear those yourself or be able to sort of outsource and get the help that you need to run that business smart and efficiently and, you know, really make good choices for your business. Because I don't think it's easy for everyone to, to wear every hat. I agree a hundred percent. For example, just to quickly add, uh, curriculum is not my strength. That's not my passion. I'm not that interested in developing it or, you know, it's the kids are what I'm after. You know, it's the right. kids being able to build their self-esteem, help them with confidence and express themselves. That's mainly what I do. Um, so I ended up now, what I've done now is I'm meeting with someone who does curriculum development as well and language development and is going to sit me down and talk me through, you know, what's going to be best for all of my different students. Um, and it's worth it for me because right. that's not where my strength is. Um, yeah, so yeah. like you say, outsource that, you know, take yeah. your anxiety away and just, yeah. Focus on the bits that you, you yeah. love and bring you joy and then... There are people out there like myself who who might fill that that void in in your sort of repertoire. So exactly absolutely. that. Yeah. So um, group, we would love to know if you have any questions. You can unmute yourself and ask them aloud, or you can type them in the chat box. Although I can't see where you type in a chat box. Maybe mine looks different than yours, but um, mine's on the side. Yeah, I can see a chat box on the side where the questions are coming up, but there's no box to to type into. I don't know. So, all alternatively, I know there's some people in the group where we're streaming to who are watching. So, if you want to just post in the group or the event, I'll get a notification and I can um, ask Kevin D on your behalf. So, we'll give that a minute. Feel free to chime in. Um, you're welcome to bring up a topic we haven't maybe covered or ask for more detail about something we did cover. Um, we'll just give it a minute. Maybe we planned this so well that we've covered every single interesting <laughs> point. <laughs> maybe. I doubt so, it. Hi. Is um, everyone? Oh, there. Oh, there here we go. go. Hi. Hi. My name is Nabila. Um, I'm also from South Africa. Um, hey. I, uh, I have um, a few questions, quite a few questions. Okay. Um, one of them is, um, see, I only have one private student. The rest, uh, I work for a, a company. Um, but I want to get more private students. So one of the questions I ask, uh, I want to ask is, 
is what's the best way of getting private students? Is it just through um, social media or like maybe groups posting on groups or what would you suggest? Do you want to chime in, Kevin D, or do you want to? Uh, either to? or. I've I've got some some information. Yeah. Okay, we'll start with you, and then I I'll finish up if necessary. <laughs> Are you wanting to target uh, a certain country, a certain type of student? What what students are you targeting? Um, I, I am a teacher and have been teaching children, but I enjoy teaching adults as well. So uh, I don't mind where from, I don't mind um, the level or I prefer maybe, maybe slightly intermediate as opposed to very beginner. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't mind where and what age group really. And do you mind me asking, where did you get your current student? Your private um, student? So there's um, a friend of mine who does, who used to do this and someone contacted, she used to work for a language school and um, mm -hmm. she didn't have time to, uh, someone gave her this lady's number and she didn't have time. So she passed her on to me. But so it is kind of a oh. roundabout way. <laughs> okay. And is she international, the student? I didn't hear that part. Sorry. If oh, yes. It. She's Colombian. Okay. Great. Do you have a referral program in place where you mm -hmm. give a student that you have a, a referral bonus? I don't. That's a really nice idea. Okay. Mm. So you set something up. I know, I know Crystal does this as well. I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you set something up, uh, for your current student, for example, you send, uh, send them some information as saying you're offering a referral bonus. So, uh, you can set it up how you like. If they refer, uh, students to you, then if the students purchase a package, however, you set your thing up that they can get a free class or two free classes, however you decide to set it up. And I find that's a really good incentive. All right. Okay, cool. So that's ah, one you. thing that's you can try. Mm -hmm. Okay. Crystal? I would also add to that. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, for whatever reason, enjoy teaching this lovely Colombian student, you could, I think it's always good to like focus in on that area, for example, or any area. So, um, let's say that it's Colombian, you figure out where your particular student lives, for example, what channels do they have in that local area, for example, the equivalent of um, Gumtree or Craigslist mm -hmm. or some online forum like that. And then because this is in the same area as your student, it's even more useful to get that student to act as a testimonial for you because Maybe they're local, maybe they're going to flag people to look at the advert. Um, maybe it's just even a surname that rings a bell locally. And then you've got the experience already in that area, that location. So people are going to think that you're some kind of specialist or you've got some kind of unique knowledge about them and they'll be more likely to give you a try. So that's what I would recommend is really honing in on a particular locale and looking at the ways to reach people right there. And then once you feel like you've saturated that location, maybe diversify from there. Okay. All right. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, I have a bunch of other questions if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Fire away. Okay, okay cool. Um, the one thing is the, what is the best platform to use, uh, in your opinion, teaching platform? What do you use, Kevin D? I use Zoom uh, for my online teaching because it's free um, and I have not had any issues with it. I've never had a problem. It functions the way it should. Um, there are quite a few platforms out there, um, but a lot of them are paid. Um, and if you're starting out and if you don't have to pay for it, don't. Yeah, it's I, I agree. As that for me. I've used Zoom for years too, and I think mm -hmm. it has more than enough functionality in its basic form. Um, I've never had to upgrade because I teach one-on-one. -on -one, so I, and, and my, like Kevin D, my classes tend to be quite short. So it's all within the, the basic framework. I would say when you're looking for a virtual classroom platform, look at the functionality that it offers for um, interaction. 
with teaching children in particular, they're getting so much more learning out of being able to interact with the materials like draw a line or fill in a blank or um, even some of these platforms are now allowing you to drag and drop things or play games like that. So it's important to test a few, I think. Um, I found that Zoom is still among the best with that functionality in mind, so I've stuck to it, but there are up and comers as well. Like I would keep your eye on a company called Koala, Teach with Koala. Um, they are like a gamified version of Zoom, for, like especially for kids and it's, you get a little avatar um, and you're in a virtual room where you can turn around and, and there are walls with different screens that you can preload <laughs> with material. It's incredible. And at the moment, it's all free. The downside of that platform is it's not compatible at the moment with mobiles or iPads. So all my students pretty much use iPad on their end and therefore I can't, I can't transfer over to that one. But um, I would say stick with Zoom and then maybe branch out as these other players get more developed. Okay. Just to add to that, sorry, and what you think Zoom can do, it can do more because I yeah. thought I had Zoom figured out until <laughs> Crystal <laughs> told me I needed to do something with something and it would work. I said, like, how do you do that? So there's actually a lot it can do. Just research, watch YouTube, do all those. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Because that was kind of my next question, my leading on question as well. like. Uh, uploading documents and those kinds of things like, okay, okay, cool. I'll play around with, with it then. Mm. Um, okay. Um, next question that I have is, um, do you make rules regarding missing classes or rescheduling and those kinds of things? Do you have like some sort of contractual thing happening? Okay. <laughs> and can you give me <laughs> tips on that? <laughs> yes. Happy to go ahead. Um, Listen, I'm very easygoing, um, and again, I've got students that know me. You know, I've built a relationship with them over the past two years, so I don't really have hassles with them, but with all of them, I do have a contract, and I do have a 24-hour cancellation policy. Um, okay. I'm yet <laughs> to actually apply it because I feel bad, um, but <laughs> most of <laughs> no, but they don't really cancel. I must be honest. With mine, they don't. They're very good. Um, they okay. let me know and they're Chinese, so if they can be basically dying and they'll still come to class, um, <laughs> which is the downside, but definitely have something in place. You need something to fall back on because you will get the odd student that just doesn't really consider your time and doesn't really get that it mm -hmm. really is a hassle for you and you lose money that way. So put that stuff in place. Mine is a 24 hour cancellation policy. I let them know that I can book leave. You know, I give a week's notice. I tell them what I expect mm -hmm. from them and what they can expect from me in that contract. And I do send it and I do have them sign it. Okay. Yep. Hundred percent same. Although I'm stricter than Kevin D and have build people, but I'd also say um, I would always recommend charging for your lessons up front. So um, yeah. we were speaking earlier about there's an option to do a subscription plan where they're built um, by direct debit monthly. But I personally sell classes by the bundle, so most of my students buy 30 classes with me at a time. And yes. then about a month before that bundle has finished, I'll get back in contact with the parent and say, you have four classes left. Please, can you make payment before X date, which will be at least two classes before the end? Because essentially what I'm saying to them is I'm going to open up your slot to another student if you don't confirm it with payment. So um, I would never get into a situation where I've I have to choose whether or not to teach a class because I haven't actually received the money for it yet. Mm. That's a sticky one. Agreed. What did you want to ask next? Um, oh no, those, those are it. That's it. What? Oh, you wonderful. ran out of questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> them as, I, as I was about to ask the thing, you've answered it. <laughs> Unagi. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's okay because I have a few more questions in the chat panel. So, um, some people have also asked about finding students. So if you feel like you need more ideas or we haven't sufficiently covered that, let us know. Um, how do you convert after their initial message? So if you've got a lead, 
how do you really convert that lead into a paying client? Any ideas, Kevin D? Um, I always offer a trial lesson. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this, so that's part of what I do. I always offer a free trial. Um, I feel that's necessary. Um, it basically gives them a chance to check me out, check out my uh, material, how I function, how I do things. And it also gives me a chance to check them out and see if we're going to be a good match. So that is something I use to reel people in. And I'm trying to say this without sounding arrogant, but I know that I'm good at what I do. I know that I'm very good with children and I know I have something a little bit extra that the children need in terms of, you know, I've studied doing a bit of play therapy. I've done quite a lot of work. So I can kind of pick up what a child needs very quickly. And that is how I reel them in, um, is through my trial lessons. And I think that I've had some parents be like, mm, uh, and then I'm like, whatever. And then they come to the trial and afterwards they're like, oh, yes, please, we want classes. You know, and I think that's really a way to just show what you have to offer. And a lot of teachers will go on Facebook, go, no, there's no need to give free trials. You don't have to do that. You, you know, wasting time, you should get paid. And yeah, that's fair enough. But it's often a way for me to get the students in because yeah. what do they know about me other than that I'm a teacher, you know, and what maybe they've been told by their friends. This is a way, a way to get them in. In addition to getting to know you, it's a, it's a way to get to know your setup, how user friendly is your platform, how exactly. uh, compatible to that student's learning style is your curriculum and, and are your lesson plans. So it's a test for everybody. And just to say, it doesn't have to be free. You can offer like a 50% reduced rate or a full uh, full price class as a trial. It also doesn't strictly have to be a trial, like you're giving something away for free. I do free trial lessons too, but I use them as a diagnostic lesson for me to ascertain where to start that student on my curriculum. So, you know, it, it can do a lot of things at once. Definitely. Um, I would also add to that, Samantha, that um, so how do you get them to take the leap? I personally create a sense of urgency. So I try to make my classes seem in high demand by using statements like, oh, I can squeeze you in or I have one class left on a Tuesday or, you know, these sorts of things so that the parents feel that sense of urgency to book on with me and secure that slot. But you can also do that by um, offering like a limited time discount. So they've done a trial or they're making the decision to join with you. Well, this is a great time because for the next 24 or 48 hours, um, your first bundle is 10% off. So mm -hmm. you just, there are different ways to create that urgency and to get people to take the leap, which is another reason why selling bundles are great. Because if they take the leap and then they have regrets, you know that you still got that student for 30 lessons. <laughs> <laughs> but that would never happen because you're an no. teacher. <laughs> Okay, this so is true. The bundles are great. Yeah. Um, do, oh, did you have something Sorry. to add to that? Yeah, yeah, just about the bundles. I also think, you know, we're joking around about them, you know, thinking it's a mistake, but it also gives them, forces them to have time with you because part of teaching is relationship building. That's yes. what it is. You know, we're creating the safe uh, learning space for people, yeah. you know, learning another language is a vulnerable thing. I don't like to speak a language. I don't know to those people that speak their language. I get embarrassed and shy and I'd rather not speak. So it just, it's a way for them to actually just build a relationship with you and focus on relationship building. It's very important. It will keep your students coming back. hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. Um, Judy asked, uh, lots of teaching experience, 28 years primary school teaching, but no business experience. <laughs> so where to start with building a company? Oh boy. Whoa. So I just want to say to Judy, my business experience and interest is about this much, really. You can ask anyone that knows me. I do not like anything about business. I do not like things about financial stuff. I'm just not interested. I'm not. If I can do this, I promise you, you can really. 
because the information is out there. It's there. I mean, just you could just follow Crystal alone and follow the steps that she advises on and you will get there. Yeah. Yeah. I think it varies by region. So um, the rules will be different, you, you know, in the U.S. to South Africa to the U.K. where I am now. Um, so it would be beneficial to look into that. But a lot of countries operate like the U.K. where you don't actually have to create a limited company up until a certain income threshold. So originally, when, you know, the first kind of two years when I started out, I was a sole trader, which is literally a freelancer. And there's a lot more support from um, even government training, uh, what's the word, like seminars and things, but also support in terms of helping you through the process with um, YouTube tutorials and stuff. Then once you've declared um, as and registered as a limited company. So I would say try to stay as a sole trader as long as you can. Um, it's a lot of, it's a lot cheaper usually too, but it's hard to advise exactly how to go about building a company because it does vary from region to region. Judy, your question could read as well. Are you, do you think it's, do we think it's best for you to start with an online teaching company? Is that what you mean? Oh, I, yeah, it I'm could. Sorry, Kevin. Yes, that's what I wanted to establish. Um, so 28 years in an actual classroom. Um, but this is a whole different ball game, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> whole different animal, <laughs> it seems to me. Um, and I find, I'm finding, I, I, I'm, I'd love to explore it. And I'm very excited about it. I love doing my chapel and with something just to have an extra string to my bow. And, um, um, yeah, I, I've got a little bit of a flame going for this at this point, but it's, it seems a little bit overwhelming, um, even despite the, the number of, of years actual classroom experience. Um, so I'm just trying to feel out, sort of, I, I realize I'm going to have to take it slowly and, and, and feel my way through it, but it's like, where do I dip my toe in first? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, would it be best to, to, you know, I mean, you see all these companies online, do I put my toe in that water first or, or where, do I, where do I start um, and not waste my time? <laughs> That's precious. Right. Do you want to answer, Kevin D? Well, I would say just from the get-go, because you're feeling apprehensive about it, and I can hear that you're not feeling very confident about it, that what I did was while I was at a company, I started my private. So I did two together. That way there wasn't all this pressure that this private thing must work out, otherwise I'm screwed. You know, it was, okay, I can do this. I've got an income coming in here. I'm gaining experience and I'm not wasting time. And I slowly, well, it wasn't slowly, <laughs> but it was supposed to be slowly. <laughs> and I was slowly going to build it up. Um, that's something I could suggest. I wouldn't just say, let me only do a company. Why not try to do both? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think um, there is, a for all of the negatives of working for a, in a contracted role, there are so many positives as well. Like you really get to hone your skills as an online teacher, which is a, is a big leap. It's a different kettle of fish entirely mm -hmm. from classroom teaching. I'm in the same boat as you. I started out as a classroom teacher and then transitioned to online and it's learning a whole new thing. So um, there's a lot of good that you can take away from a contracted role. And um, especially if you find a company that doesn't have minimum hours or has very few minimum hours, like Kamini said, you know, there's no stopping you from sort of um, bringing your contracted role down, lessening the hours mm -hmm. as your private work comes up. And then you're not in a financial state of mm -hmm. concern either. Yeah, and I think also just to experience the curriculum um, aspect of it, which I'm assuming is, is so completely different to your day-to-day -day stuff in the in a grade five classroom. <laughs> Absolutely. And to keep in mind, um, there are so many curricula out there mm -hmm. from company to contracted company. Like I've I've got personal experience with three and 
the three curricula they use were totally different from one another. So it's a great way to see what your options are. Mm. Yeah. Perfect. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks for all your input. You're welcome. Yeah, you bet. Um, okay, so I have another question that asks, do potential parents really look for the TEFL or similar certification as a deciding factor? Ooh, what do you think? I don't know, truthfully. I don't know that I've ever had anyone ask me if I have it, um, but I just say that I do. It's part of what I, the you know, the information I give people. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. From I think the parent it probably depends. Yeah, I think it probably depends on the parent and and on the the culture too, because some value that uh, qualification more than others. I would say that. Um, and so I am a certified teacher, like a, a public school teacher, and it's almost to my detriment in some situations because the sort of average income for this industry is what it is. And clients come in and they have an idea of what they want to pay. And I think in a lot of situations, they're not that fast about having a, like a professional or a language specialist. They want to get the lowest price they can and and not really um they don't put a lot of value on an extra qualification i think that personally that um tefl and tesol and all of those were designed as a box ticker i hate to say it because there are a lot of countries like specifically china whose mm -hmm. government imposed that they were only allowed to hire qualified certified teachers so they had to come up with some quick easy cheap way for these teachers who may or may not have had degrees even to become certified teachers so that they could tick that box on work visas or what have you and fulfill the government requirements i think for that reason when you look around for courses if all you want to do is obtain a job then the course you choose really has a very little relevance and you can go for a cheaper course. If you're looking for courses for the personal aspect of actually learning some really great skills and maybe you don't have a background in teaching, so you're interested in learning how to teach, then um, that's where you might be more picky about which te TEFL course you choose. Hi, it's it's Samantha who asked that question. Um, yes. Thank Hi. you for your answer. That was helpful. I just wanted to add, or ask you directly, um, since you're a public school teacher, you also teach ESL, but you don't have a specific like TESOL or TEFL certification because because I'm the same way. Like I have I have a master's degree in education. I have my certification with ESL endorsement, so I never needed that. But now that I'm looking into it. I don't know if that's necessary to find clients in certain areas that they really look for that. Right. I would say if you are already a certified teacher and especially a language specialist, mm -hmm. you definitely don't need a TEFL or a TESOL certification unless you're like looking to get your MA in TESOL or something, which is a totally different thing. Um, I think that you cover it and that a lot of parents will sort of factor uh, state certification above that anyways, because going to university to do a teaching certification for a year or two is always going to trump a like week-long TEFL course. <laughs> so I, okay. I personally I mean, That's what I thought. I just didn't know because a lot of times when you go to apply to like companies, they always require that. So that's, that's what I'm I mean by like, the why does that trump it? Because yeah. No, okay. It Thank does. You. It's only that these companies need a baseline, they need a standard, and they don't have the resources to look at every um, application in detail. It's kind of like, do you have this course or don't you? And that's how they sift through. So outside of these contracted companies, those TAFL certs don't really hold their weight. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Did you have anything else you wanted to say about that, Kevin D? No, I agree with you in this case, for sure. I mean, it would be different if she was looking at a company and that's what they were specific. You know, some of them don't even, like you say, they don't even look what you've got. They just, if they don't see that, then. You know. Yeah, exactly. 
And you kind of can't blame them because they've probably got like an HR team of two ladies sitting in some dark office, just sifting through thousands of applications. <laughs> <laughs> or a lot of them nowadays, I know that um, like VIP Kid, who I worked for, they don't even, like the first round of um, applications, they no human ever sees because it's like a pro forma. You tick a box and if you tick that box wrong, your, your application is in the bin. So yeah, no, that is such a good question. Um, so Samantha, you also asked about prices. Let's see, do you give a discount for higher quantities or if you normally charge $30 per session, would you offer a bundle for like 250 or 275 for um, 10? What do you do, Kevin D? How do you sell your classes? Yeah, I do it that, you know, I sell 12, 24 and 36 bundle. Mm -hmm. um, and then the price per lesson decreases as the bundle increases. I mean, yeah. otherwise there's no real incentive for them to take the larger bundle then. And it, like you said, it's beneficial to me because then I know I'm guaranteed those lessons for X amount of time. Um, yeah. So I definitely yeah, I do, do that. Same. And uh, people, they want a reason, <laughs> you know, they, they're yeah. willing to buy more if they pay less in a way. So they, it's really a great incentive for people. Exactly. Um, yeah. Adding on to that, is the bundle, you know, does it expire? Is it for a set schedule? If they buy 36 classes, I mean, do they get to use that anytime? How does that work? I think it depends on you. So the way I work is I, all my students are regular students. So they all have, I think I have one kid that has once a week, but the rest of them are two times to three times a week. Um, and it's the same set days and the same set times. So I know that they're going to be with me for eternity and that's fine. But I think it depends on, um, you know, how you work it. For example, I don't have a, a platform where people can go onto my website and book a lesson, you know, and then just book their own lesson and whenever they want. I manage my bookings a certain way. Um, that means I know who's coming, when they're coming, exactly how many times a week they come. So mine don't have an expiry date, but they get used up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank I'm, you. I'm the same. I'm the same as Kevin D. I have regular students who commit to a regular slot. And then in our contract, it says, you know, how much notice either party needs to give in order to mm -hmm. take some time off or whatever. Um, but I do think that if you operate a scheduling service where your student can go in and book their own classes week to week at the time that suits, it might be a good idea to put a cap on like when that bundle expires because you don't want to be like five years down the road <laughs> somebody's still hanging on to their last two classes and wondering what's going on. So I would leave some, you know, extra time like add on a month or two to what would be reasonably acceptable. But I think you're on the right track with that anyway, Samantha. Thank you. Do you find that most of your clients do purchase the bundles over or you only offer bundles? I'm just trying to rework. I'm right now offering just like month, like drop in classes or pay as you, um, I call them pay as you go or monthly. And I'm finding that most of my clients are continuing and then they're like, you know, each with three classes pass by, I have to then check in. Do you want another month? Do you want another month? And so I'm thinking I really need to extend it to these longer bundles um, just to help me yeah. and help them. I don't offer singles. Okay. Yeah, I only offer bundles. My lowest is 10. What about you, Kevin D? Uh, what lowest bundle? Do you offer like pay as you go or one off? No, I, sorry, hang on, Maya. Um, <laughs> so no, I offer 12 is my lowest bundle. I don't offer um, uh, single lessons. I don't. But having said that, I'm my students are all Chinese. So they are used to that on the platforms. They're very much used to that system. Um, and that is also why I use that system. But I know there are different right. teachers that do pay as you go, you know, where they pay after a lesson or just before a lesson they pay. It, yeah. I think it depends on you and who you're serving. Yeah, actually, this is one reason why I was inquiring to you, Kevin D, about the possibilities with TutorBird for um, subscription-based 
billing because I think that would interest me in terms of most of my students tend to go for 30 lessons and a lot of them only take a class once per week. So I'm acutely aware that I'm committed to that student for 30 weeks. <laughs> yes, yes. And also that, you know, when they make a payment, it's a nice lump sum, but then there's a big stretch of time where that student anyways isn't paying and it tends to be rather, you know, peaks and troughs income wise. So I think having your students on a pro rata monthly fee would be a great way forward as well. Mm. I might consider that. Ruth asks, can we recommend the best TESOL or TEFL course? Oh my gosh. I did my TESOL course in Canada in 2005 <laughs> and I don't like, I, I don't even know if the company still exists. What about you? <laughs> Yeah, I can't help you there. I must be honest, I went for an affordable one that was still acc accredited. Um, so I don't know, truthfully. But yeah, it depends I, what you want to do. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, know, if you're ahead. just going for the companies, obviously you don't want to get uh, something rubbish because you, you want to know what you're doing and you want to be good for your students, but you don't have to buy the most expensive. Do your research, ask around, check on Facebook. Lots of people have different recommendations and you can just check them all out yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I think, um, I can't recommend a specific company, but I can say what to look for. So if you're looking for the box ticker that will get you a contracted role, find a Groupon TESOL course and go for it. You know, like $19 off the shelf. It, you know, does what it says on the box. Mm. If you're looking for um, more personal tuition, something that you'll take with you in terms of the skills that you'll build. You'll want to look for something that's more in depth, that has higher hours. You should be looking at 120 hour course as a minimum anyway. Um, but the ones that offer a one-to-one -one tutor or live teaching practice, even if it's online, but you've got like a, a tutor assessing that class with a real student, those are going to be worth their weight in whatever their fee is because if you're coming from a non-teaching background, that could be really the only contact that you have and the only um, support and guidance that you have until you hit actual clients. So there are two different things to consider with that. But hopefully it kind of points you in the right direction. So, wow, everybody, that was amazing. Thank you for all your great questions. I hope that we hit upon everything in enough detail, but if not, feel free to post to the group. I, we would love to have, um, you know, more conversations like this and more input in the group. Oh, oh, so Judy said she has a 150 hour TEFL certificate. Would further training on specific online teaching be helpful? Um, Possibly, but oh yeah, I to I TEFL is great. Teacher Record also offers a 120 hour one. I would say if you've never taught online before, it could be worth investing in. You might also like to offer maybe um, a package of let's say six free classes to a student. Like um, I was just approached by somebody looking for volunteers for Afghan refugees to teach them English. So by doing some volunteer work to students, you could really hone your skills and practice your techniques without, you know, messing up a paid client relationship. <laughs> so it's not That's a great idea. Yeah, it's not necessarily that you have to pay for that training is what I'm trying to say. Well, COVID, COVID over here taught us a lot about online teaching, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Everything, online <laughs> everything. <laughs> yeah, learn pretty quickly. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. All right. So again, yeah, post any additional follow-up questions or comments to our Freelance Masterclass group. Please help me in thanking Cavendi for giving up her Tuesday evening um, to come and chat about her experiences and successes in freelancing. I think what she had to say was so informative and it's like she's in the same boots as we're all in. So it's really mm. good to, to hear it. So thank you, Kevin D. You're welcome, everyone. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us. It's great to yeah. be able to share this. If it helps anyone a little bit, great.
Absolutely. I totally agree. All right. And we'll see you back in the group. Enjoy your evening. Bye.